So uh, thank you for joining us tonight. I'm Ruthie Hewitt, the Adult Services Librarian at Prescott Public Library. And um, speaking tonight is Kristen Kaufman. She's a creative writing instructor at Yavapai College. And tonight's presentation is hosted by the Central Arizona Writers and presented with funding from the Friends of the Prescott Public Library. Um, we're gonna take your questions at the end. So um, you submit it through the Q&A function, which if you're on a computer, it's on the bottom of your screen. If you're on a phone or tablet, um, on the bottom right-hand side, there's three dots, and you click on that for the Q&A. Uh, Kristen, thank you for being here. Thank you for inviting me, and thank you to Pat Fogarty and the Central um, Arizona Writers for inviting me. I'm excited here to talk about um, description and writing, and um, I'm just going to read our little uh, workshop description here quickly. Um, the novel, short story, poem, and other forms of fiction and nonfiction have a very potent component in common. They must paint through the skilled knowledge of language, clear images in the reader's mind. Writing relies solely on the skill of the writer to captivate the reader, to create for them worlds that never were and characters who've never lived. Additionally, what do we do when we fail to describe uh, characters well who were people or who were who were people and places which to which we want to return so I kind of added that little end there because um because today I want to talk a lot about uh, creative nonfiction. I know that a lot of our writers locally are creative nonfiction writers who write from their own experiences, whether you're working on a memoir or an essay. And um, while I am uh, targeting this workshop to creative nonfiction, this will work for all genres. I mean, this, these are standards in creative writing that will work for um, fiction writing, for poetry, for any of that. So. I'm going to share my screen here because I have a little PowerPoint prepared for you all. Here we go. So we're going to dig deep into description. Um, so here's my note again. I know many of you are creative nonfiction writers, so this is tailored to you. However, all of the tips here can be used for any genre. Okay, so when I was kind of thinking about this workshop, I thought often um, there's kind of an adage in um, creative writing when we talk about how there are two kinds of writers. One kind of writer is somebody who writes dialogue really well, but they don't necessarily write good description. And then the opposite is true. We have people who aren't really good at dialogue, but they write very descriptive scenes that somebody can really picture themselves in as the reader. Now here are some common challenges in writing creative nonfiction. Um, and these are kind of more specific to creative nonfiction, to people who are writing from their own personal experiences. You remember the feelings of what happened, but you don't necessarily remember concrete details. So for example, you know, you remember when you were five years old and you got in trouble, but you don't exactly remember where you were when you got in trouble for that one thing. Um, another common thing is that you remember what was said, but not exactly how things looked. So you remember the heat of the conversation. You remember, you know, breaking up with your college boyfriend in the quad, but you don't really remember how the quad looks. You just remember the conversation that you had when you broke up. Um, you are familiar with the setting, but maybe not during this specific event. So again, you know, you're in the quad, or maybe it's a situation like you find out that you're, um, you know, your 17 year old sister is pregnant, right? Um, you remember getting that news in maybe your front living room and you remember what the living room looked at in different periods of your life. You just don't remember what it looked like when you got the news. And then uh, another common and probably more commonly for uh, those of us who, uh, who age and forget things, your memory has fogged. That thing must have happened at that one place and with those people, but it's been too long for you to remember specifics, right? We remember things that happened to us, but some of the specifics are lacking. And so, so these four things can serve as sometimes writer's block for a creative nonfiction writer. How does creative nonfiction writing work? Um, and, and more importantly, when you look at those four uh, common um, 
ailments to the creative nonfiction writer, th this pink question comes up, how can I write something accurately if I don't remember how it went? Right. And, and we latch on to that idea of accuracy so much that it gives us writer's block. Um, our memories are fallible. So that's the first thing to remember is that, I mean, I could be writing about something that happened 10 minutes ago and even then it may not be accurate. Uh, you may not remember word for word of what was said or experienced, but neuroscience says that we remember a filtered reality as it is. Right. So if I'm having a conversation like you and I are having coffee and we're sitting down and we're having this conversation, I remember what I said and you remember what I said, but we remember the emotions around it and not necessarily the word for word syntax because our memory is shaped by other experiences that we have. Our memory is shaped by um, feelings that we emote in that moment. And so kind of interestingly, um, I can have a conversation with you and we're having coffee together and the words that you use are going to be in a vocabulary that I understand and I remember um, and vice versa. So already our memory is filtered, right? Modern neuroscience also says that every time we tell a story, we rewrite the memory of what has happened. So we no longer remember what's actually happened, but now we remember the last telling of that story, right? So for example, if I'm telling the story of um, my neighbor who hit me with a car, right? I'm going to remember telling that story in the emergency room. And then I'm going to remember telling that story to the police officer who takes the report. And I'm going to remember telling that story to my best friend when I call her up and say, can you believe what just happened to me? But every time I tell the story, I just remember the last time I said it. And so progressively details will drop off. I'm not saying this to freak you out, but what I am saying is it's really important to be aware of how fallible our memory is. So it's actually kind of, um, it, for me, it's comforting because I know when I sit down to write a creative nonfiction story, you know, this, this block of accuracy no longer strikes me as so, so monumentous. Instead, I can have this moment of, okay, I'm giving myself permission to write what could have happened, what I think happened, because there's no way that I can accurately portray what happened, detail for detail, word for word. This is also true for fiction and poetry, right? Every time you tell somebody what fiction story you're working on, your memory of your story will just be in that last telling of it. And for that reason, there are several writers in, uh, in, in several writing communities who won't, like they think it's bad luck to talk about their novel before they actually have a publishable draft. Because they think that, you know, that bad luck means that, you know, all of the energy goes into the telling of the story, not in fact to the writing of the story. Um, and then in poetry, often we'll, we'll tell a poem and like you'll see writers like Billy Collins who will, you know, be off stage and ready to walk on stage and read their poem. And here they are like kind of editing in the book, right? Because they told the story or the poem last time a little bit differently and they like that better. So they're going to edit before they walk up on stage and, and say it. So kind of interesting. So knowing this, knowing how our memory works and uh, knowing kind of where these blocks come from, how do we tell a good story? Well, here we are talking about description. Here are a couple of steps that are really helpful for me when it comes down to writing it. Because, you know, first of all, we need to relinquish expectations, you know, and it's difficult to do because you have this picture in your head of the story that you want to tell and you're, you know, at least for me, I'm so enthusiastic about it. And I want, I want it to be the finished product so badly, but I actually have to sit down and do the work. And then in sitting down and doing the work, sometimes challenges arise. And, and I think I am not unique in that experience. So here's the, the first step. Go with what comes first. Um, a lot of us are kind of put the uh, burden on ourselves to write chronologically, and, and you can choose to do that. Um, in nonfiction, write what you remember. And so if you feel like you want to write something that, um, you know, if you're writing your, your life story and maybe something that happened 
a month ago is more of a more of a strong memory to write and record now then go with that one um, if you really want to start with you know like the David Copperfield chapter one I am born right you can do that if you'd like but um, just write what you remember first you just want to make sure that you get those details on the page you can't add to details until you know first what the details are that you have um, for all genres write where you feel the strongest pull to write this may not be chronological and that's okay. So whether you're writing fiction, nonfiction, poetry, you know, you have this picture in your head of this, this passion, right? This story that is compelling you to be told, right? Write that first, because that's the thing that is, um, that you're so attracted to. So put that on paper first. For all genres, relinquish expectations. Just write small. I know that's kind of hard to do if you have this big picture in mind. I'm a global thinker, so I like to have this big picture in mind, but just write small, start small. Write what you want to focus on right now. You're not going to write the whole book or the whole story right now. So just focus on one scene. I know it's difficult to do, but, um, and, and a way to do that too, is you can set the kitchen timer for 20 minutes and just sit down and write and write the strongest details first. Okay, so step two, rewrite without peeking. No peeking. Uh, without looking at your first draft and after giving it the space of at least two weeks, more time is better, at least two weeks, go back and rewrite the scene. So no peeking. The strongest memories and emotions will be what stays the same. The fussier details can be what goes, right? So if you're going to write the scene of, the, of when you found out that your 17-year-old sister was pregnant, right, you're going to remember the shock. You're going to remember the initial emotions. You're going to remember um, maybe who told you, right? Those things are the things that are going to come to you first, right? And so just go with those strong emotions. Put the draft away. Give it some time. Come back to it rewrite it again. And again, who told you? Maybe where you were will come through the second time. Maybe you'll suddenly remember a key phrase that was said, right? Um, the strong things are the things that stick out. The fussier details about where your mind went when you got the story, those, those can go. I mean, they might be important, but for the most part, they can go. And then step three is go back to fill in. Okay, so after another two weeks, again, more time is better, but after another two weeks, yeah, now you have two drafts, and you have two workable drafts, and you can look at the two of them, and you can decide which one you like better. Um, you want the adrenaline of writing to settle down, right, because the reason that it needs to be at least two weeks, but probably more time, is because if, you, if for any of you who've done any um, any writing. You know that when you're in the heat of the moment and you're sitting down and you're trying to select the right words and describe the right phrase and to come up with the right adjectives, right, you get so wrapped up in the adrenaline of writing. And so you need that adrenaline to settle down. You, not, you need to kind of forget what those exact word choices were so that you can have that moment where you are distanced from the draft. The distance is the important thing because then when you're reading it, you're reading it more as a third party person. Of course, you still remember writing it. You're not entirely objective, right? But when you read it with a more objective viewpoint, you can see it for what it is rather than for the emotions that you want to tie to it, right? And it's those emotions that cloud us in our writing and in our judgment. Right, so the more space, the more objectivity you have, the better you can see those two drafts that you have, those two working drafts, and then you can determine which of the two you want to keep. Or maybe you want to keep this paragraph of this one and this paragraph of that one, and that's totally fine. Um, you want to look for what is authentic, right? Um, I've been in situations where I've written creative nonfiction, and, and I've written something that, you know, feels true. It could be true. And I put it away for like, I don't know, a couple months. I come back to it and I read it and I'm like, I don't know. Did I really go in there then? And then I look at maybe, I, I never delete anything, by the way. So I don't never delete pictures and never delete emails. So then I'll go back and I'll like fact check myself. And then I look and I'm like, no, I did, I did that on a different day. So you want to look for authenticity, right? Even though it feels true that you could have done this one thing at this one time, um, space will help you with that as well. 
Okay, so you have your two workable drafts. You've taken this part, paragraph of this piece, this paragraph of this piece. Now what you have is a skeleton of what the scene could be. So only after, you know, we're three steps in, do you go back and flesh in the details, right? So here we are with details. Uh, a common question from nonfiction writers is, what if my memory is terrible and I don't remember too much? Join the club, my friends. <laughs> when, you, uh, when you have a job, when you get older, when you read as much as you know, teachers and librarians and writers do, your memory is just not gonna be good. Sorry, I mean, hopefully this isn't like earth shattering for some of you. Um, so your memory isn't going to be great, but you have to work with the details you have. I'm going to read a little section here. Um, I read a, this memoir um, last week. It's called The Seasons of My Mother, a memoir of love, family, and flowers by Marcia Gay Harden. And what was particularly interesting about this is that um, Harden's mother has Alzheimer's. And in having Alzheimer's, she has this, um, the, the writer has this desire to record her mom's memories for her because her mom can't remember things herself. And so, um, so Marsha Gay Harden is writing these scenes. Um, most of, of course, most of what she remembers, but um, you know, it's, it's kind of like tribute to her mom. She's trying to write down as many scenes as she can remember, flesh in the details. There's no scene in the book in which her mom is not featured. So it's an interesting way to write a memoir because it has a focus. So all of her memories have a filter. So the first section I'm going to read is from a section called, My Mother is a Brightly Ribboned Maypole. There are facts I know only because I was told them. The facts attached to vague pictures in my head, snapshots really, and then feelings get attached to these snippets of memory, and then there is memory itself, fact. We lived in La Jolla, then Carmel by the sea, where I have a vague memory of the woods with a rope swing and going into the woods alone with a girlfriend and her brother when I wasn't supposed to. It is a little bit of a creepy memory and exciting because, all, because we all swung on the huge rope swing and ran back from the woods when we heard my mother calling. I got in trouble for that one. There is a vague memory of a disastrous Easter when I couldn't find any eggs. A vague memory of chasing my sisters on a bike, all the while jealous that they were faster. Glimpses of feelings, a snapshot of going to a funeral with my mom, a snapshot of accompanying my mom to a trailer park where we dropped off our ironing to a wispy brown haired woman in a polyester t-shirt who smiled a chipped tooth smile. A body memory of pushing a doll on a swing. A body memory of spanking the doll because she was a bad girl and had fallen off the swing. A body memory, I'm sorry, a feeling that my mom liked me, even loved me, but the absolute knowledge that she wasn't partial and didn't play favorites. A sketchy memory later verified by mom of me coming out so proudly one morning and announcing I got dressed all by myself and indeed the clothing was matching. It was a job well done. Remembering mom not wanting to praise me too much because it might go to my head and a physical memory of being hugged and enveloped by a kind black woman. Apparently we had a babysitter when I was three or four and I just loved her. She was a plump woman with large breasts and she would wrap me up in her arms and hold me tight with her head thrown back, laughing. It is perhaps the safest I have ever felt. Even if I do not fully recall the woman, I recall the emotion. But real moments of visual clarity don't really begin until we moved to Garden Grove, California. I was five years old. I remember a girl with a barking German shepherd up the street. I remember being with her in the ditch in the park near Ralph's grocery store. I remember when my sister told me Santa wasn't real and she got in trouble because I was inconsolable. I felt horrible she got in trouble and I felt horrible Santa was dead and I felt horrible that I couldn't stop crying. 
I remember ants in the backyard. I remember a summer plastic blow up pool. And I remember stubbing my toe in the driveway and mom putting stinging iodine on it, soothing me with her cool voice and cooler hands. I remember going to the beach with my family and getting covered in tar, then using turpentine and a hose in the driveway to get it off. I remember my mom, not yet a friend, but more of a presence, a presence of love and gentleness and resigned discipline, a presence of beauty, a stabilizer, a tuck you in at night mom, a woman making her home and garden beautiful, creating a practical nest for her chicks. She didn't do it to compete with the neighbors for the prettiest yard award. She did it because as she put her steel key in the front door, she loved the smell of the gardenia in bloom and she would angle her brown curly hair toward the plant, inhaling for a second before she dragged the paper bags of groceries across the floor in the foyer. Okay, so what does this section show us? Couple of things. First of all, it's okay to remember fragments. As you can see, some of these descriptions are really interesting and they, they kind of read as a list. In some ways, I don't know if, how many poets we have in the audience, but in some ways this reads kind of as a prose poem. Um, or a list poem, this idea that you just have these little snapshots, these little fragments of memories, but the description is strong. And some of these strong descriptions are um, like the rope swing, right? So we have one description, which is the rope swing, but with it, we get a sense of texture, you know, with that, that tactile rope feeling. We get a sense of movement, right? Like in depending on how fast they were going, I don't know, but like the breeze on their face, right? Um, because she describes that rope swing in the woods, I picture a kind of like shady or dark environment, probably a damp environment, right? Um, so there, especially when it's Carmel by the sea, right? So, so you have that like sea breeze, moist air, humidity, could be hot, could be cold, right? So, so something as simple as a rope swing can serve to bring a kind of description to the, to her paragraph. Another one, she uh, lists body memories, right? Body memories of, uh, of hugs and of spanking the doll and pushing the doll in a swing, right? Those are body memories because there's movement to them. And there's, again, that very tactile feeling. Um, other really good ones are, um, her babysitter who would wrap her up in her arms, hold her tight and laugh with her head thrown back. Like we can visualize that. Um, it, is this, it is perhaps the safest I have ever felt. It's a strong statement from a woman who's in her 50s, right? It's the safest that she's ever felt. So here we have maybe three sentences about this babysitter, but it's very uh, poignantly described. Uh, a couple more. Uh, I remember ants in the backyard. I remember summer plastic blow up pool. I remember stubbing my toe in the driveway. I feel that, right? I feel that like gritty cement on skin feeling. And then especially the stinging iodine. I don't think they have stinging iodine anymore, but I remember that from when I was a kid and it would stain my skin orange, right? These are details that are super important to writing because that's what makes the writing come alive. Um, I remember going to the beach with my family and getting covered in tar and then using turpentine and a hose in the driveway to get it off. I don't know if you've ever had that experience. Last summer, I went to uh, uh, Corona Del Mar with my family. We got tar on us. We didn't have turpentine because we were in an Airbnb, but we bought olive oil and Q-tips and we got it off with olive oil and Q-tips, you know? So these are, again, like, this is the stuff that life's made of. This is a moment that I remember and the olive oil and the Q-tips is what makes the, the memory strong for me. So put that in your writing. It's okay to remember an emotion over a situation, kind of like what she says with the babysitter. It's probably the safest shit she's ever felt, right? So that emotion is powering her description. So typically we discuss showing versus telling in writing. And typically when I tell you this, um, I prefer showing over telling, right? You want to have about 80% showing and 20% telling. And because I tend to favor dialogue over description, most of my showing is in conversation between characters. However, I think it's really important to acknowledge that 20% of the writing 
or approximately, you know, it'll differ from scene to scene, but 20% can be telling. And what I just read for you is in many ways telling right? Because she's describing for you, she's trying to show you what childhood was like for her. And so she has a list of very telling descriptions and that's okay. Um, so here's an example. I remember when my sister told me Santa wasn't real and she got in trouble because I was inconsolable, right? This is telling because she's summarizing the scene for you, right? Um, typically it's important to understand where the power of the scene is, Right, because if she's telling you that she remembers when her sister told her that Santa wasn't real, right? A showing writer would put that into a scene, would have description, would have dialogue, would have the sister who has a name uh, saying these specific words to the narrator who then would respond with specific words and a specific emotion. We can see here that she was crying, right? And then we have a uh, that the sister got in trouble because Hardin was inconsolable, right? So getting in trouble is summarized. If I were to put it into a scene, if I were to show you, then you would have, you know, the parents putting the sister in timeout or go to your bed or whatever. And so that would be showing. So it's okay to tell sometimes. While this is telling, while this is summarized information, it is in a section of telling details that show the memoirist's early memory. So the details, right, the specific scene of finding out that Santa wasn't real is really not going to make that much of a difference in the overall story arc of the memoir. So it's okay to summarize or to tell those details because that's not really where the focus of the story is, right? The focus of the story is her mother who has Alzheimer's and her trying to build these memories for her mom who can't remember anymore. And also it's okay to use negative space, right? So, so what's negative space, Kristen? Uh, negative space is an otherwise unused spot in the na narrative to add details and characterization, right? So, so if you're writing and you recognize there's a blind spot, Right? There's a character who isn't able to say something. Or if you recognize that there's a historical, uh, a moment of historical significance that you're kind of glossing over. Right? It's, it's significant enough to spend time on it for your narrative, but you haven't yet. Right? So, so it's okay to use that negative space. Um, other things to pay attention to in your writing are the middling drafts, right? So you followed my three steps that I outlined a couple of slides ago, and you're working on this draft and you're, you're you know, reworking it, reworking it, reworking it. Um, or you maybe you have like one complete first draft. How do you know when you need to add something, right? How do you know when you're reading a scene and you reread it and go back and say, mm, I think Kristen would say, I need to use uh, more description, right? How do you know that? So here are a couple of tips. One, always look for the use of the five senses, right? We want to know what the food tastes like. We want to know what the smells are in the room. Um, Pat and I ahead of time were talking about like each room has its own smell, right? You walk into a room and it smells like something. What does it smell like? Um, I was just sharing that when I was growing up, there was a girl a couple houses down the street whose house had this specific smell and I couldn't figure out what it was. And it was just really interesting. It was, it was pleasant and it was strong and I couldn't figure out what it was. Um, but in the last couple of years, I've really enjoyed figs and dates and I realized that that was the smell. Her house smelled like figs and dates. And so it's kind of interesting, like once you put a name to what that smell is, but everybody's house has a smell, every space has a smell, so name it. Um, I think it's really easy to rely too much on sight descriptions and on sound descriptions, right? It's way too easy to rely on um, like verbal dialogue, right? Nonverbal dialogue is interesting too, but that's not necessarily the five senses related. Um, but you have dialogue and you describe what everything looks like. But as much as you can, pull in taste, pull in touch, pull in smell, because those things are what make a descriptive scene really stand out. You also want to anchor the narrative in the scene, 
right? So what are what are what is happening around these characters other than just talking? This is what we call talking heads in fiction. You know, when you have two characters in a scene who are conversing. Um, strictly speaking, it's probably the most boring scene. Right, so you wanna make sure that what's happening has to be included. Dialogue should only be included if the story couldn't possibly be the same without it, right? So you have these two people who are talking and what they're saying has to be included because it has to be important for the story. So what's happening around them, right? Um, now, what I love to do is I love to portray how a description of the, the setting around those talking characters can help enhance those characters, right? So if you're, in, if you're describing maybe some uh, dialogue between two characters who are, maybe they don't trust each other, maybe there's some anxiety, right? How could you pull that out in the descriptions around them? You have to be careful of cliches because you could say, oh yeah, there's, you know, clouds in the horizon, right? That's kind of, that's kind of expected. But maybe, the, maybe there's some other description. Maybe there's a dog barking in the neighborhood. Or, you know, maybe there's a lady down the street who uh, is like looking through her blinds, right? Like, see if you can describe things that are actually happening in the world around them that mirror the impression that you want the reader to get from that dialogue. Can you use adjectives in interesting ways? Maybe they are onomatopoeia, right? So maybe the word that you're using has a sound to it, right? And so automatically you're figure like a swoosh, right? A swoosh is, is a description that also has a sound to it. So maybe that would work. Or maybe the adjective can call to mind an active verb. Right, so just in her ref, in uh, Harden's reference to that rope swing, right, that's very active because I can see it swinging. I can feel the texture of the rope, right? So think about how you can use your adjectives in interesting ways. So I'm going to read an, an, one last section from her. Um, it's a section called My Mother is a Miraculous Bamboo, which does seem a little ridiculous as a title, but go with it. Okay. Even a mother with five children can be lonely. The day starts at 6.30 a.m., breakfast is made, five eggs, five strips of bacon, five toasts spread with jam, five glasses of orange juice. Children dress and scatter socks. Toothpaste is left on sticky brushes, the remnants sliding down the porcelain sink like mint-striped slugs. Doors slam and shoelaces are broken as we run for the bus. Then the house is quiet except for the chatter of running water as mom rinses the dishes, her quiet hum under the clink of china and scrape of metal pans. Chair legs brush up against the table legs and placemats return to their darkened drawer, she hums, now gliding down the hall with the family pictures talking to each other across the frames. And into the bedrooms, she checks that the beds are made as they were supposed to be, opens a window, feeds the goldfish and lovebirds, then cleans the kitty litter and grits her teeth as she picks up dog hair sitting like a forgotten dandelion fluff in the corner. She doesn't hum now. She just works and vacuums, dusts and throws t-shirts and underwear in the laundry. Hours pass. Another window is opened and the chirp of birds reminds her to stop for a minute, to actually look outside. She stares at the pyracantha just beginning to burst into orange flame-like berries and she makes a mental note to pick up some bright yellow chrysanthemums from the Japanese market on her way home from the commissary, which is next on her list. She hums again now, imagining the flower arrangement evocative of fireworks she will make later in the day using pyracantha and exploding yellow chrysanthemums. Okay, so what does this section show us? There is movement to description, right? We, we have like the sound of the chair legs across the floor as, she, as she's pushing the chairs in, the slide of the drawer as she's putting the, the placemats into the drawer. Um, she's walking around the rooms and cleaning. And so you know, she's checking for the beds, she's picking up the laundry, she's vacuuming, she's dusting. So those are the, the, the quieter sounds. So the scene actually begins with, like way more sound, right? Because she has five children. She's making bre breakfast for five kids. So you hear like the sizzling of the bacon, right? You hear like, you know, the, the orange uh, juice like splashing into the, into the, 
the drinks, right? Um, uh, shoelace breaks. Uh, there's uh, toothpaste running down as a mint striped slug. Like all of these are very uh, viewable descriptions, but some of them are sound descriptions as well, but often many of them are moving. So whenever you can try to include moving active descriptions. There is no dialogue in this descriptive scene. That is not the scene of characters sitting in alone, remembering interactions with others. The interactions are implied, but not overtly said, right? So for, for I think probably the boldest implication of dialogue is that the um, beds were supposed to have been made, right? So, I mean, you, you remember what it's like when you're a kid and your mom's telling you to make your bed, right? She's, in this case, she could be shouting it up the stairs, right? Or the kids could be taunting each other with that, with that threat. Oh, if you don't make your bed, then you're going to have to do dishes tonight, whatever, whatever, right? So there is lots of implied dialogue. Um, when they sit down to breakfast, I don't imagine that they sit down silently, right? So what, what did they talk about? You know, who's, um, who has soccer practice after school? Who has, um, in a, you know, who has a play date with a friend at the playground, right? Whatever, whatever. So these are implied interactions. They don't need to be included necessarily because the scene won't change with them. So that's an example of how dialogue should only be included if it changes the scene. In this case, it doesn't change the scene. But the implication of the dialogue is strong enough. The description of a scene should imply more description of character, right? So Marsha Gay Harden does not tell us that she has a stay-at-home mom, but we can see that in what happens in the action, right? Allow us to figure it out for ourselves, to, to connect those dots. In fact, readers, in many cases, prefer to connect the dots because then they kind of self-congratulate. Like, they can see it themselves and they have the thrill of having figured that out. So kind of the balance between um, description and implication is that you want to give enough description so that those descriptions are clear and they're poignant and they're strong, but not so much that the reader feels like you're saying they're stupid for not figuring out that toothpaste is gooey, right? Like I'm not, we're not going to read a whole paragraph long description on toothpaste, right? So you, there needs to be a fine balance between providing enough strong description and allowing the reader to connect the dots on their own. So here's the rule with description kind of to help with this. Um, you can show us the picture of an apple or you can describe an apple for us. It's an apple, it's red and a little shiny and it has a green leaf but you can't do both. You can't say that this is an apple, it's red and shiny, has a little green leaf, and then show us the picture of the apple, right? So, so you can either show or tell, but don't necessarily do both. So here's some closing thoughts I have for you all. How can you paint a picture for a reader that doesn't summarize the feelings for them, right? In this scene we just read with the mom, right? Um, which by the way is negative space, Right? Marsha Gay Harden was not there to experience mom's day for her, but she can see from what mom did that mom must have done these things. Right? So this is the, an example of a use of negative space. Um, she doesn't summarize for us. She starts off the section by saying, even a mother with five children can be lonely. And then she shows us all the things that she does in a day. Right, so she's implying that it's lonely and it's up to us as the reader to read the details that follow and to figure out that loneliness for ourselves. How can you use descriptions in an active way? One of my favorite descriptions here is that she puts the placemats in a darkened drawer, right? Um, that, that feels active to me. It also feels really accurate, right? Because it feels like these placemats have a place. They have a role. You know, they're moving in and out of this drawer that, yes, is darkened during a non-meal time, but gets pulled out again. It's like that sound of the sliding drawer, right? So descriptions can be very active, and they should be very active because it's engaging for the reader. And is there a scene that you've written to which you can go back and flesh out some of these details, right? So I want you to think about some of these scenes that you've written. Maybe, maybe you think, oh my gosh, Kristen, you so called me out because, you know, I have a character of two talking heads, two characters in a scene. They're talking. There's nothing else going on, 
right? Well, you can go back and flesh it out, right? Maybe these two characters are talking while they're walking. So there we have some action, right? And as they're walking, let's say they're walking around the courthouse square in downtown Prescott. What are the things that they're seeing, right? There are people hanging out on the lawn. There might be a band, just a casual impromptu band playing in the gazebo, right? They might pass by some people who are just parking and are they going into the restaurant? Are they going to one of the churches? Are they going to Franny's, right? So there's some movement there. Or maybe as they're walking down the Whiskey Row side, maybe they hear a fight from one of the bars, right? So, so there are things that can happen around these characters. Their dialogue can still be important and it can still be central to the scene, but what's happening around them that can help enhance what's happening in that scene? And I am going to open it up to questions now. So I'll pull this out of share. And so, um, so Ruthie's going to pop on. So if you want to chat any questions that you have in that chat box for us. Well, <clears throat> thank you so much, Chris Kristen. That was uh, really great. Um, yeah, right now we don't have any questions, but we'll hold on um, a minute here. Um, is there any way we can find your um, writing? I have uh, two published novels that you can buy on Amazon. The first is uh, Just Pretend, published in 2007, and the second one is Breakable Rules, published in 2008. I also have some um, some poetry published in some collections. Um, one is in the Pitkin Review, and I think you can find that on Amazon as well. That's great, thank you. Yeah. We have a few people saying thank you and uh, nicely done, good job. Thank you, I appreciate it. And we will also, if you have um, friends or family that you think might um, wanna see this, we, the library will be posting it to our YouTube page. Um, so you can search for Prescott Public Library or if you just type in Prescott Writers, um, you'll get there too. So we'll have that posted up there in just a few days. Um, if you think of any questions or anything you'd like, um, like Kristen to answer, I'm sure she could answer those via email at a later date if you want to email um, the library and we can get in touch that way too. So somebody else says, very interesting, helpful. Uh, thank you so much for the well-organized and informational presentation. Happy to do it. Glad you guys got something out of it. Well, thank you so much again. Um, that was really great. I'm not a writer myself, but it was very um, inspirational. I had a lot of great ideas in there. Um, and so we'll have another Prescott Writers next um, month, most likely virtual as well. And so these are always on the um, fourth Tuesday of the month at six o'clock. Um, somebody's asking, are the books under your name? They are. Yep. So the spelling of my name is K-R-I-S-T-E-N. And then Kaufman, K-A-U-F-F-M-A-N. So you can find them all under my name. Okay, great. Well, thank you. And I hope you all have a good night. Bye-bye. Thank you.